Hi everyone! Welcome to Read Asian event. This month of June, we are celebrating Read Asian as we put the spotlight on Asian stories, arts, and culture. This afternoon, learn more about speculative fiction, Asia's unique perspective on stories and its relevance in contemporary life with Dean Francis Alfar. We will be joined by Vida Cruz. Vida Cruz is a Filipina fantasy and science fiction writer, editor, artist, tarot reader, and con runner. Her short fiction has been published or is forthcoming from Strange Horizons, Podcastle, Expanded Horizons, and various anthologies. She has been nominated, longlisted, and recommended for the Hugo Award, the British Science Fiction Award, and the James Tiptree Jr. Award. She was a 2018 Tiptree Fellow, and in 2019, she published her first fantasy short story collection, Beyond the Line of Trees. Currently, she's a freelance book editor, with the Darling Axe and is the co-director of Fayacon Fringe under the larger umbrella of Fayacon, a BIPOC-centered convention for science fiction and fantasy readers and writers. Vida will be interviewing an advocate of speculative fiction, Dean Alfar. Dean Francis Alfar is an author and advocate of speculative fiction. His books include the novel Salamanca, short fiction collections The Kite of Stars and Other Stories, how to Traverse Terra Incognita, East of the Sun and Other Stories, and A Field Guide to the Roads of Manila and Other Stories. And the children's book, How Rosang Taba Won a Race. As an anthologist, he is the founder of the Philippine Speculative Fiction Annuals and the editor of anthologies including Fantasy, Filipino Fiction for Young Adults, Horror, Filipino Fiction for Young Adults, Science Fiction, Filipino Fiction for Young Adults, Maximum Volume, Best New Philippine Fiction 1 and 2. And ang manggagaway at iba pang kathang agham at pantasya mula sa gitnang Europa at Pilipinas, among others. Dean's short stories have been anthologized internationally in books such as The Big Book of Modern Fantasy, The Time Traveler's Almanac, and The Year's Best Fantasy and Horror, as well as various magazines and online publications. His literary awards include 10 Don Carlos Palanco Memorial Awards for Literature, including the Grand Prize for Novel for Salamanca, as well as National Book Awards for the graphic novel Siglo Freedom and Siglo Passion, the Philippines Free Press Literary Award, and the Gintong Aklat Award. He is a member of the Manila Critics Circle. Dean is the owner and chief creative officer of Kestrel, a digital design and development company, and Logic, a social media management company. He lives in Manila with his wife and tango partner, award-winning fictionist Nikki Alfar, his son, Rayo, and their daughter, Rowan. Let's all welcome Vida and Dean. Hello. Hello. It's so nice to see you again, Dean, even if it's just virtually. I know, right? <laughs> All right. All right. Uh, let's get into it. So, for those in the audience who still need clarification, what is speculative fiction and what are some examples of genre conventions? Okay. Speculative fiction or spec fic is the umbrella term that we have been using to describe stories that fall into the genres of uh, fantasy, horror, science fiction, uh, magic realism, and basically everything in between. Uh, the shortcut around 10 or 15 years ago was to say non-realist, but that's not very helpful because as you said, there are very specific uh, genre elements uh, that would be able to define the specific types of stories. So in terms of uh, what makes uh, something speculative fiction, well, it all depends on the genre that, that you are writing. So what are some examples of these conventions? So, for example, if we are looking at a fantasy story, there are tons and tons of possible conventions for an author to use when crafting the story. A good example would be uh, a portal, a portal to a secondary world. So a good example of this is the, the wardrobe in C.S. Lewis's uh, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. Uh, which uh, the, the protagonists would cross into Narnia from, who, from. <laughs> so uh, Secondary World is a, a very fun and interesting convention that is used in fantasy writing because you're able to create worlds out of whole cloth. 
uh, for science fiction, wow, there's also a lot of possible conventions that you can use here. Uh, things like uh, technology, uh, uh, space flight, uh, clones. For horror, there is the creation of suspense and dread. Uh, the protagonist, uh, a type of a horror story could be the old gods type of story, like the Cthulhu, uh, Cthulhu mythos that uh, is all about something rising, something ancient rising from, from beyond. So those are some examples of genre conventions for the three biggest genres under the umbrella of speculative fiction. Thanks for clearing that up for us. Okay, so um, to move into the nitty gritty, because I'm sure that everywhere in the world, everyone's got their own flavor of speculative fiction, right? So what do you think sets apart Asian or even Philippine speculative fiction from Western speculative fiction? Okay. First of all, I would like to unpack the term Asian speculative fiction because I have issues with it. Uh, right. I understand that uh, it's very helpful as a marketing uh, term because it separates us from the West, right? But yes. it's also, I'm sure you'll agree, not very helpful at all because it tends to conflate all the different cultures that are found in our neck of the woods into one monolithic mega Asian culture. And uh, when we do this, we end up stamping out all the unique features of each individual culture within the Asian sphere. And uh, it's, it's terrible because what happens then is it's similar to like going out for Asian food. So everything just becomes a mishmash or, or a fusion. But how much more wonderful would it be to say, let's go out for Filipino food or let's go out for Thai food or Vietnamese food. Uh, granted, in uh, speculative fiction and all the cultures here in Asia, there are certain commonalities. But it's also beautiful for us to be able to see and celebrate all the unique cultural differences that uh, make each particular culture uh, amazing. And uh, when, we, when we talk then about Asian speculative fiction, I just want us to keep this in mind that uh, it's always more helpful to drill deeper. Okay. So having said that, Asian speculative fiction for me would be uh, more appropriately described as fiction that comes from the countries uh, in the geographic landmass designation of, of Asia. And there is a lot that's going on here. So what sets us apart? Uh, we first have to take a look at the biggest country in Asia, and that's China. And uh, the amazing thing about China is their production of, uh, of speculative fiction, in particular science fiction. I was fortunate around uh, three or four years ago to attend the very first Asia Pacific science fiction convention in Beijing. And uh, it was really mind blowing and eye opening because I was able to see the difference in terms of uh, how uh, the creation of literature there science fiction in particular is supported and welcome it's it's uh it's a huge endeavor and the successful science fiction writers there in china are treated like rock stars so you know what i'm talking about right Lida? uh writers such as uh Liu Qi Xin, yes uh, yes um, three body problem and all that so in contrast, here in the Philippines, uh, it's pretty much as it was uh, in terms of publication a decade ago. So yes, there are efforts on our part and uh, there are publishers that publish more and more speculative fiction now. But in terms of support uh, from both the, the readers and uh, government and uh, even private institutions, uh, we're pretty far. So I just wanted to point out that this has uh, a big impact uh, because other people writing in, other Asian people writing in, in uh, 
other countries are able to to live on writing. Uh, here in the Philippines, we we cannot. So we all have different jobs, and we have our sidelines and what we call our rackets, just so we'll be able to pay the bills, right? So in terms of uh, what sets us apart, then it becomes a matter of cultural differences. But again, that's a pretty surface level answer because I think that the proper answer would be something to do with how the intersection of things uh, actually influences output. So apart from being, let's say, a Filipino, I would have to say that uh, uh, the concept of intersectionality uh, actually plays a great part in what makes what we write very different uh, from everybody else. So we would have to take into consideration things like uh, gender, uh, sexual orientation, uh, class, uh, education level, uh, the environment in which you grew up, uh, religion. Um, all of these things contribute to who you are as a writer and as an author, and it gives you your unique voice. So you cannot be uh, somebody who is uh, taken away from your cultural context. What I'm saying is that inevitably, whatever speculative fiction piece you write, it is influenced by who you are, where you grew up, uh, what, what made you. Because the stories that you tell are drawn from your, it's a combination of your experiences as well as research, as well as your own very specific cultural context. So the other way to look at it is it is, and this is very simplistic, it's non-Western. So <laughs> we have been reared because as you know, we were under Spanish rule for 300 years then under uh, the Americans for like 40 years, but we are, big consumers of Western media. So the mythologies, for example, of, of Europe are the ones that we are most familiar with simply because it is more available. So when we talk about uh, Western style storytelling and the types of stories that are told, the type of characters and uh, the type, even the milieu and the setting, then you'll have castles and knights and princesses and jousts and things like that which are not actually part and parcel of our Filipino culture. Um, so when we write very specifically about our culture, the Philippines, when we draw upon the myths and legends and stories of our archipelago, we are able to show a different perspective in terms of what types of stories we can tell. So we don't have knights, but we have agimats, we have amulets, uh, we, have, we have wonderful things going on here. We have our own underworld. We have the gods of the sky. And uh, we have all of these things that are different. Uh, I think <laughs> that's my long-winded way of answering. <laughs> <for you. laughs> well, it kind of um, bleeds into my next question. Okay. Which you which you answered in part, okay. and like I know you said earlier about the diversity of all these cultures, and I know that Philippine culture is not monolithic. But that said, with the intersectionality of all the cultures of the Philippines, what is it about the cultures of our country that lend themselves to speculative fiction? So that's a good question. Um, I would say that. Uh, one of the big commonalities that uh, provides this intersection amidst the various Philippine cultures in our archipelago is a love and respect for the environment, uh, for the world around you. Our various cultures are able to see and experience the world with a sense of wonder and gratefulness. So this harkens back to the days when uh, technology was, was not on top of the priority list of everybody, which allowed them to experience life on a certain level. This allowed them to put values on dreams and uh, uh, designs and symbols for tattoos and uh, allowed them to think about 
questions like why is this happening why is the storm coming this way why is there a cycle uh, what does it mean it also allowed them to deal with their fears uh, fear of the invaders uh, fear of the unknown so all of this is anchored on a deep respect and love for what is around them so i'm not saying we're super nature people but it cannot be denied that with all the different cultures who speak and tell stories in the different languages in the mountains, in the forests, and the seas of the Philippines, there is a love for what is around us, I would say. That's a great answer. Mm, so I've been to a couple of your talks oh, and yeah. <laughs> well, I've been to a couple of your talks and often you say that young writers are the key for this genre and honestly for the literary scene to move forward. And that said, we are also seeing a trend upward of speculative fiction being published. So what do you think the genre has to offer creatively and why do you think young writers are more drawn to speculative fiction these days? First of all, I love this question. Um, let's put a little context into this. Growing up here in the Philippines, I could only find the type of fiction that I love to read in very select places like a bookstore. And uh, there were only a few volumes that I could find in terms of science fiction or, or fantasy or, or horror. And it was something that I really loved and longed for. And I really wanted to one day create or tell a story along those lines. So what was available then in terms of the output of the Filipino writers was uh, along the lines of realism. The, the two main lines of realism here are domestic realism and social realism. So these are stories that tell uh, about people living their, their, their lives here and uh, about their hopes and dreams and uh, things that happened to them or, or history, for example. But it was never much to, to, to my taste. Uh, so I secretly hope that there would be more stories that invoke the sense of wonder that, that I love as a young person. Now, let's fast forward a couple of decades and we are already publishing the annuals, uh, my annual uh, Philippine speculative fiction. So we are getting, my co-editors and I are getting uh, submissions from all over the Philippines, as well as from uh, Filipinos from all over the world. And I'm happy to say that a lot of these uh, authors were young and uh, they were learning the ropes of, of, of telling stories that they wanted. And that was uh, a big source of happiness and delight for me. It, it continues to be so because it is the, the young people who are uh, making this, uh, um, making speculative fiction grow. So it's not me, uh, it's them. It's all these young authors uh, telling different stories. Uh, what draws them to speculative fiction? One of the things would be it encourages their imagination. It allows them to escape the humdrum world and uh, jump into a fantasy or jump into science fiction. Uh, the key term in speculative fiction is speculative, right? So it allows them to create and concoct what if. And uh, I'm just glad that uh, the environment is so welcoming now. Uh, because there was a time where in magazines and publications would not accept what we now call spec fic because it was not considered serious literature or it was considered something like a tale. Uh, but uh, I'm told right now, and I can see actually that uh, publishers such as uh, Anvil, uh, the late lamented Visprint, uh, as well as uh, university presses like UP Press, Ateneo Press, and the USD Press are putting out books of speculative fiction. And a lot of them are by young people. So to go back, it's because it allows them to exercise their imagination. 
it gives them freedom to express their concerns in a way that they want to or that they find interesting. Uh, it allows them to give themselves representation because they probably grew up like me on a diet of Western media. So if there was a contest, Vida, and we, you and I were asked to name Greek gods, we could probably do well, right? But there are people here now, young people, as well as older people, uh, in terms of fiction writers, as well as comic book creators and filmmakers, who are embracing our own local mythologies. So what's happening right now is it's young people leading the charge. Uh, by telling stories, they're actually creating culture. Uh, and they are creating something that other people down the line will be able to build on. Because uh, the nature of stories is it's actually a conversation. And uh, some conversations can really inspire. Uh, sometimes I'm inspired by work done in the West and uh, it challenges me to create something that is mine or Filipino or uniquely ours. And I hazard that it's the same for a lot of the young creators and young storytellers. So it allows them to represent themselves because we are not, again, knights with um, and mages with fireballs uh, riding in jousts and things like that. But instead, we have our own thing. And the nice thing is you don't even need to go far to see spectacular differences that can challenge, amaze, and inspire because of things like uh, output from Singapore, uh, output from Japan, output from Indonesia. Uh, stories are coming out and uh, genres come out suddenly like uh, silk punk and things like that. <laughs> and uh, utopian stories and stories that, that give hope. So I think that uh, the young people are taking advantage of the fact that they have been freed from the shackles of realism. So they don't need to tell stories that perhaps they find they cannot relate to in that kind of genre but instead they can articulate their concerns and, and their hopes and dreams and fears via speculative fiction that exercises their imagination. That's what I think. Such a beautiful answer. Okay, so my next question, I actually encountered this, I've encountered this a few times as a developmental editor. Um, one time, someone who was a college student, creative writing, asked me how do you turn a realist story into one into veers into the speculative and i think this answer might get a little technical but okay. this will be helpful for anyone who writes realism and wants to try spec fic okay so uh, okay first of all i want to unpack that question uh <laughs> but what, what comes to me is that you start off with a realist story Okay, so let's spark that thought because I would like to tell the person who asked, uh, how amazing would it be if you started with speculative fiction in the first place? Okay, but yeah. we'll start that too and come back to, to the real. <laughs> okay, okay. Uh, there's actually a way to do this. If you have a realist story, all it really means is that you are anchored in reality and you're working very hard for very similitude which is to say your characters act as if they're real people they live in a real place or exist there and their concerns are pretty much the concerns of regular people so if you were if you want to inject an element of this of speculative fiction or actually transform it midway into spec fic all you need to do is take a page from the old Twilight Zone serials. That's, that's one way, which is you set up something that seems mundane and normal. A uh, man and a woman, a married couple wake up, they have breakfast, and then suddenly the world changes. So there is a very easy way to do that by just injecting the strange. You can do it in a spectacular, dramatic fashion as if suddenly things are different 
or it can be a slow creeping thing like uh, the mug changes into a palace, uh, their dog, their pet changes into uh, a fairy dragon, something like that. So you can introduce elements as you see fit, but before you even start doing that, you actually need to have an idea in mind. Uh, you have to ask yourself, what is the story that you're trying to tell? And uh, what is the speculative thing that, that you want to explore? I would advise the young writer who's thinking about doing this to think about what if. So all you need to do is uh, think, what if people in love would change color depending on the nature of love that they feel? So that would be an interesting thing to, to write about. So yeah. uh, a courting couple would suddenly see each other and they're tinged in different colors because one loves with this abandon of love and one is more like you're just a friend. <laughs> so without even saying anything. So something like that. So. Uh, work with a what-if scenario and integrate that into the story. I'll have you know also that uh, a lot of the more interesting spec fic stories start off as pretty mundane because it's a nice technique to use. So like there's this establishment of reality and then you subvert it. You turn it upside down. It becomes interesting. It catches the reader's attention because they're like, what the hell is happening here? <laughs> or, or what could happen? And in the hands of a careful writer, you're able to tease out something beautiful. Remember, when you write speculative fiction, it doesn't always need to be done in terms of grand gestures. Sometimes something that is small can make the most significant impact. Well said. Well said. I really hope that that helps that young writer if they're listening to this talk. But okay. Wait, but wait. Yes. Uh, I want to unpart the other thing. I want to tell that young writer who asked you to try writing speculative fiction in the first place, which means simply choosing a genre, fantasy, uh, perhaps science fiction, and then constructing from that point. There are a lot of people, I think, because I, I teach writing also, their concerns with writing spec fic is Oh, Sir Dean, uh, I, I, my imagination is not that good. I, I'm, I'm afraid of world building because I've heard this term thrown around that it's so important to have like a world that you can build with all the details and I just can't. Well, you don't have to. Uh, <laughs> you can build the world as you go along and just show what is needed. Uh, there are people and there are stories and novels and cycles of novels that are premised on world building, but that need not be what you do because there are so many different kinds of uh, speculative fiction stories that you can try your hand at. Maybe down the line when you get inspired or you really have the discipline to create a world, you can do that. But for now, just create as you go along and use your intuition use things within you, uh, things that move you and inspire you, and just try to tell the best story you can. That was unparked. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so like, you know, um, lots of writers working in the scene today, including myself, I mean, whether you like it or not, we kind of owe a debt to you because you have been championing spec fic oh, since <laughs> yes and so since you've seen the scene develop um what right now would you what kind of spec fic would you like to see more of locally since there are so many subgenres and stuff like that okay when we began publishing the annuals in 2005 i think for the first four or five years of the annuals, it was like the Wild West. Really <laughs> stories from different genres, talking about different things written in different ways, and it was wild. And uh, that actually um, 
consolidated or actually no solidified my stance that I would always prefer to be descriptive than prescriptive, which is I would never be the one to tell people this is what you should write. I would <laughs> rather receive and then take a look and describe. Look at all these things that people are writing about. As time progressed, uh, writers who got published who would send stories again uh, to be considered were improving and I could see that uh, there was more of a maturity in terms of not just their writing styles or techniques, but in terms of their themes and their concerns. So as, the, as time passed with the, with the annuals, we saw people writing about uh, intensely personal stuff, uh, things that have to do with identity, uh, things that have to do with uh, their place in society. There were political stories that, that began to pop up. And it's amazing to see them side by side with just, you know, a science fiction story about uh, people in a flying saucer just having zany adventures, right? Uh, but there was always this introspective slant of, of, of stories. As we moved into the pandemic, I got a chance to uh, judge for a competition for Philippine short stories, speculative fiction stories. And I read like a hundred stories last year. And of course the concern was the pandemic. And uh, it was a bit depressing because a lot of them were uh, started off semi-realist before veering off into the speculative. But what these stories most what most of these stories had in common was hope hope as well. for some people it was hope that things would get back to how it was uh, things that they have lost they could find again uh, people they have not seen they could embrace again and places that they could not visit they could go to again but some of them also had a different kind of hope uh, it was a more exciting one. It was a hope for something new. And uh, they were speculating about what was beyond the pandemic, which means that their thought process was along the line of this too will end and we will have something different and hopefully something better. So if you were to ask me, what sort of stories do I want to see right now moving forward? I want less dystopian stories. We've had a lot of that in the past decade. I want more hopeful stories. I don't want blindly optimistic stories, but I want stories that show us a future. And I want stories that show the Filipino in it. And I want stories that show the Philippines in it. I'm not saying that everything should be lovey-dovey, you know, and uh, all wonderful. Certainly, there can still be uh, torment and despair and all that. But I want to see more stories that deal with us going outward. So in terms of science fiction, I want to see the Philippines in the future. I want Filipinos in space. Okay? <laughs> in terms of, of horror, I want people to still retain the respect for our past because that is always a very important thing and we are the guardians and custodians of our past and the stories about the past that we retell, right? But I want us to recognize that there are new monsters in society and I want us to write about those. I want us to write about the monsters that take away land from the Lumans. I want us to write about monsters that decide that men have the right to tell women when to have children. I want people to write about the societal monsters in a spectic way so it doesn't come across as meh, right? Yeah. It's certainly, certainly possible. In terms of fantasy, I want people to create new secondary worlds. I mean, Vida, you know that in the West, Secondary worlds are, are dime a dozen. There are new novels and novel cycles and trilogies that have a new world every so often. I want more 
people to follow the example of uh, Edgar Samar and his Janus Silang uh, and create a world not just here in the Philippines, but something completely different and speculative with characters that are us. I want to see representation of the Filipino. I want us in all our diversity and glory, all our dark skin, all our beautiful flat noses, all our, our shortness and heights, all our bodies, uh, whether buff or thin or overweight. I want to see more of this. And I want to see more characters that are more representative of the young people today, which means not just people or characters who talk about their concerns, but are them. I want to see trans characters. I want trans men. I want trans women. I want gay characters. I want it all because we have the opportunity now, and the young people especially have the opportunity now to, to rest control, to, 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 to wrestle and take control of the narrative. And by creating these things, create a foundation for the future so that there will be more acceptance and there will be more representation. So if I were to circle back in the midst of my babbling, I'm sorry, Lila, I'm really like this. It goes <laughs> to hope. I want hopeful stories that show us more of the Philippines and the Filipino in all our glory and agony, in all our anguish and, and, and dreams and shame and, and really all our hope. That's what I want. I'm going to take a few seconds to sit with that. That was nice. <laughs> all right. So what I'm seeing here is we have big dreams for the scene and what it can do. Well, let's talk about support then. What kind of books, programs, conferences, so on, do you think that the local scene needs in order to grow and thrive? You know how it is, Nida, when you're at a restaurant and uh, you have a budget so you can only order, you know, a small yeah. plate of food? And then mm -hmm. you see the people at the next table and they have several beautiful, expensive dishes and they're enjoying it. Yeah. That's how I feel about this question. <laughs> Since Vida, I want everything that <laughs> the West in particular has and what other countries in Asia have, like China and Singapore in particular. From China and Singapore, I want us to have something like government incentives to, to write so that there can be uh, workshops, there can be programs that uh, help young people uh, write so they can be taught or if they have questions, they can be guided. I want there to be conventions uh, for books and stories. I want the author to be recognized. I want the stories to be celebrated. I want us out of the ghetto and I, I want us out there. I want what the West has. I, I, I want the book tours. I want the vibrant publishing scene. I want people to get excited about a fantasy novel that's coming out in six months. You know, on Facebook, I see all my Western author friends and they do their announcements and then they have their book tours and now it's Zoom tours and, and all that. But sadly, we don't have that here. We don't have much because uh, reading is not really the priority of government. As you know, there are other things that the government has chosen uh, to prioritize and worry about or spend their money on. But if I were to make a wish, all in the spirit of anguished hope, I hope that in the next few years, there will be a change. And people will begin to value story more. And let me just spread the umbrella a bit more and take in our beloved realism. Fine. <laughs> All stories. I want there to be the time when in like Singapore and New York, there would be uh, excerpts of stories in, in the subways or on the trains. I want 
a better library scene. Our beleaguered librarians are doing what they can, but you know what? They have so little support from the schools, if they're school librarians, or even from, from the government. I want books to be more accessible. I don't want the print book to die, but I also know that the digital thing is uh, a new creature in and of itself. And there are so many things that we need to wrestle with in terms of making that a reality be the uh, accessibility of, of cell phones, for example, uh, Wi-Fi in the provinces. Uh, there are so many things. But I believe that a consolidated, coordinated, uh, hope-driven set of incentives from government as well as uh, private institutions, as well as us, the writers, ourselves, and the publishers, if we all work together, certainly I believe that we can begin something and begin to improve from there. With the goal, with the end goal of making, creating an environment in the Philippines where speculative fiction, no, when all fiction, all stories are valued and loved and are accessible, and are read, actually, by people. That is what I want, since you asked. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> That's what you get. <laughs> mm -hmm. All right. Well, thank you for that wonderful conversation, Dean. Okay. <laughs> Thanks, Vida and Dean. That was um, very informative and inspiring. And Sir Dean noted on... Oh, fully booked! <laughs> <laughs> noted on your, list, on your wish list for the local speculative fiction. I wish we could be, you know, um, take part in growing the local spec fic scene. So, you guys are doing so much already. But we can all do more. So that's my challenge to you guys. Thank you. Okay, um, so before we end the, the event, um, let's play a little game. So Dean already knows how to do this. Um, Terrible Vida. No. <laughs> <laughs> so this is just um, very simple. You know, you, no need for you guys to think about too hard. So we will ask lightning questions. Um, you can explain your answer in one to, th one to two sentences, okay? Okay, so I first do that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, yeah. Vida will answer first, okay? Vida okay. Will answer first. Okay. okay, Vida will answer first. Okay, for first for this or that. Okay, um, science fiction or fantasy, Vida. Fantasy. But that's just because that's the way my brain is wired. I would like to write more science fiction though and read more. Okay, Sir Dean. I am a fantasist at heart. Uh, it's in my blood, and it's it's an effort for me to write science fiction. But like Vida, I also want to do more, and I'm trying. I'm trying. But sometimes in the midst of writing, I think, you know what? This will make a better fantasy story. <laughs> <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Oops. Okay, next. Um, dystopia or utopia? Can I say neither? Because they're both... <laughs> Extreme. Pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you you uh, you could you only have to read a lot of YA and Ursula the Guin's the ones who walk away from Omelas to realize that both situations are pretty bad. Right. Okay. Sir Dean. If it were a spectrum, I'm like Vida. I would say neither. But if it were a spectrum, I would lean more towards Utopia, but stop short, and say instead, hopeful with flaws. Right, okay. That's the kind of story that would interest me. A mm -hmm. utopian story, and sure Vida would agree, is beyond the concept or the twist. It's really boring because everyone is peaceful and happy and there's not. And I'm sick and tired of dystopian. Not yes. in the sense that I hate it. I enjoyed it, but it's, you know, let it rest for a while and come back 10 years from now. Let's have when we're not. Global yeah. yeah, when we're not living in a dystopia, hopefully. Yeah. <laughs> I was just going <laughs> to say. <laughs> Okay. Um, in a in a war, would you rather be one inch tall or ten feet tall? What? Vida. <laughs> <laughs> one inch, cause you'll never see me running away. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's that's good. Okay, thirteen. I, I need to be practical. If I were ten feet tall, I'd need more food, right? 
and uh, <laughs> would be an easy target. So, like Vida, I will be one inch tall, and okay. you know what? I could live on a on a chocolate bar on a Kit Kat for for a while. So That's true. <laughs> the only problem, Vida, is you need to recognize that the blast radius of something will affect us tiny people more. Oh, but, drat. <laughs> right. So we're we're one inches. <laughs> okay, that's a very good answer. Very practical. I love it. Okay, next. Would you rather have the power to go back in time or access the future? Vida. God, that's that's a difficult one. I guess go back in time because I'm researching a lot of pre-colonial stuff right now and the books we have are not <laughs> enough. I'm even part of this specialty Filipiniana FB group. For books, and we're all just mine, 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 mine on all these rare books that shouldn't be rare in the first place. Wait, Vida, UST has unearthed a vast collection in the past years of old books. Ooh, okay, okay. Uh, uh, coordinate with the with the library. Okay, maybe something you like is there. Okay, for me, okay. Um, I don't want to go to the future because I'll just be depressed because I won't really get there unless it's just short-term future. But let's say 100 years from now, it's not my lifetime. I would rather go back to the past and then relive moments with, with heartache and poignancy and then write about it, knowing that <laughs> I really cannot change what has gone before, but I can learn from it. Yan. <laughs> 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 Only see universe na answer ah. Okay, last question for this or that. Write all year or read all year? Hmm. Ako, I'll answer. Okay. I would rather read all year. There are times kasi when 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 I need to take a break from my process of writing and just recharge. And just read. But my caveat is it has to be my choice to read, which means that the pandemic year, it was not my choice <laughs> to be <laughs> in the house with, with a few of my print books because I had gotten rid of my physical books. And uh, you know, it was hard. So it was also hard to write. But I um I began as a reader. And I continue as a reader, so I think I would enjoy reading. But there has to be good stuff to read. Okay. okay. So, yeah. okay. so I've been suffering reader's block for the last couple of years. And yeah, so that it means that I have a hard time reading novels, fiction. Oh, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what happened there. And the pandemic is not helping. So recently, I've only been reading comics and some nonfiction. But even that is hard for me to get into. So I think I would like to read all year because that means that this block is gone. So you can you will read all year so you can write all year. <laughs> yes, exactly. That's what I'll do the next year. <laughs> okay. Okay. So... Next, we have the quick questions. Um, okay, it's not first, over. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. it's not yet over. I'm sorry, Sir Dean. Last right. three questions. Top three books by Asian. Your top three recommended books by um, Asian authors or artists. Vida. <laughs> okay, my first one is "Never Have I Ever" by Isabel Yap. It's on my list. Sorry! <laughs> um, another one. The Wolf of Aranyaro by K.S. Viroso. And, oh my. I want to say Dean's books, but then, you know, you're already there and you're already walking self-promo if you're here. So, <laughs> oh. no, no, but like, you're there. But I do recommend his book, though. One last. Wing of the Locust by Joe. Donato Ching Jacob, who is a friend of mine, and it's a very good book. Pick it up, please. I hate you, Vida. I should have answered Perfect. first. <laughs> <laughs> okay, for me, uh, Isabel Yap's Never Have I Ever. Uh, okay. I, I had the privilege of uh, reading it before it got published, and I, I gave a little blurb because it's phenomenal. 
it's it's okay. wonderful. Uh, to get a, a taste of a Chinese style science fiction, get the three body problem by uh, Liu Cixing, and uh, another good collection of uh, uh, speculative fiction by a Filipina is uh, Heroes, Villains, and Other Women by Kate Osias. Okay. However, I would be remiss, so I'm sorry it's, it's not going to be quick, if I did not mention the marvelous things happening in Singapore. Uh, the guy leading the banner charge there in terms of uh, speculative fiction as well as uh, uh, queer fiction, and uh, he's also a playwright and a poet, is Nang Yixing. Okay? And uh, Yish, uh, if I were just to choose one book, it would have to be Lion City. Okay? okay. And uh, also check out works by our my favorite Filipino writer there, Victor Ocampo. Oh yes, I forgot to mention Victor, I love his book. Uh, and uh, the Infinite Library is his book. And uh, Victor is a wonderful writer because I cannot write like him, which makes yes. me love him even also, more. Also, he writes science fiction, which and means extra love. Fiction, right? So it's, it's hardcore. It's really there. Mm -hmm. but, uh, for the Singaporeans living there who are producing work, I'm very happy because uh, uh, Epigram Books there, a publisher, gives out this, this award every year. And it really uh, helps recognize uh, fantastic fiction that's happening there. So uh, look for works by Mayhan Bui, Daryl Killing Yam, uh, Noralia Nora Seed, and uh, Sufyan Hakim. Uh, these people are creating marvelous fiction that you should check out. And of course, uh, we have a friend there Jason Eric Lundberg, who is who, who during the pandemic was frighteningly uh, able to put out a novel and uh, a novella. Okay? <laughs> so it's amazing. So check out his work. Uh, I need to go back to China because I met a lot of people there. So look for work by Hao Jin Fang. And of course, Ken Liu, who is not China based, he's US based, but he is. It is with his translator's hat that I need to cite him here. Uh, Vida knows this, right? He, he's like a gateway into uh, a lot of Chinese fiction. Yes. It's amazing. Okay. His own fiction is pretty good. And of course, uh, if one book by him, go with Paper Menagerie. Okay. Uh, here in the Philippines, I will double down on what Vida said. Check out Wing of the Locust by Joel Donato Jacob. Uh, it's amazing and it's published by Scholastic Press. I mentioned Edgar Samar's uh, The Janus Trilogy of Books. Uh, check out from UP Press work by uh, Christine Ong Muslim. Uh, she's not just a fictionist, but also a, a poet. Okay. Uh, and of course, check out uh, the best of Philippine speculative fiction. There, I'm, I'm promoting it now, Vida. <laughs> <laughs> It will give you a taste of the different types of stories that uh, Filipino speculative fictionists are writing. So that's my very short answer to the quick question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for those recommendations. Okay, top three tips for those who want to start to write their own speculative fiction. What? That could be an entire talk in itself. Okay, the best tip na lang. Number one tip. Go, Vida. Okay, so a few months ago, I put together a PowerPoint and a talk called Ways to Decolonize Your Fiction. And maybe that's not beginner level, but I think that everybody could benefit from new perspectives in telling stories. And sorry, this is tip number two. You need to write and read all you can right now while you're not published because when you're published, suddenly you're self-conscious and you don't have the same freedom as you did when you were not published. Right. Okay. So, Dean. For me, nothing technical. It's similar to what Vida said. Uh, consume, devour all sorts of books and writings, not just in the uh, spheres of your interest and enjoyment, but go outside. Uh, read creative nonfiction, read history, read manuals, uh, watch movies, listen to music, devour, devour. 
And then sometime later, you'll be able to regurgitate bits and pieces of that as a beautiful fiction. And my second tip is don't be afraid to fail. Vida and I know this as, as writers. We don't always get things right when we begin. There are times you'll have false starts and there are times you'll have doubt. But you need to push through. It's all part of the process. What matters is finish your draft. That is my third tip. Get the first draft done. Once you do that, you're almost there. And that's the hardest thing to do, just finishing yeah. the draft. Right. Thank you very much. Um, Sir Dean, I saw from your status update on Facebook that um, you had an idea last night and you're... In <laughs> <laughs> You're able to finish a, a story, a novel. Congratulations. No, not a no? novel. It's a short story. No okay. one Okay. Akala ko eh. Okay. So my last question is for both of you, what's next for you, Vida and Sri? So go Vida. Vida, what's up? What's next? I for am right. Okay. I am writing a retelling of the Hans Christian Andersen fairy tale called Wild Swans, but I am setting it in a secondary world na pre-colonial Philippines. I love it. Is it long? Yes, I'm, it's probably going to be a novella. I'm oh, trying yeah. to tell myself, no, not a novel, but yes. Yeah, very nice. Uh, for me, uh, I'm, I'm working on my next collection of fiction. I already have a lot of stories, but I want to write a couple more and maybe just one longer one. Uh, the pandemic has not been kind to me. Uh, I was not able to produce anything last year. Uh, it was really depressing. So my depression and anxiety got triggered and really bad. But uh, this year... I was asked by the inquirer to write five stories for them. And I did that. So I called it the Pandemia Cycle. And the fifth and final one is coming out next week on Monday. And these five stories will be part of my collection. Coming soon. So uh, I challenged myself. I wrote science fiction Vida. Ta -da -da! Okay, so ah. we'll see how, how it is received. <laughs> It's a mix. I had science fiction, <laughs> horror, and all that. So, yun. Yay! Good luck to your um, um, next stories. And we are very excited to, to, to read it. Um, hold on. Can I say something? I would like to thank you guys, uh, Fully Book, for always providing this kind of a platform and opportunity for us to talk about the very things that we love doing, which is writing speculative fiction and talking endlessly about it. I'm sure Vida is as happy yeah. as I am for, for this. Uh, anything that we can Damn. do to help <laughs> encourage the creation and inspire other writers to, to go out there and, and do things. Uh, yes. Proof that there is support. So I'm very thankful for the book. And I'm very happy it's Vida Cruz who interviewed me and talked to me. <laughs> Yay. Of course, thank you rin po, um, to you, Sir Dean and Vida, of course, for always being generous of your time and your knowledge to to share it to, to young writers, to readers, and yon. Um, That's it. Um, thank you very much for your time again, Vida and Sir Dean. And to everyone who joined us today, we hope that you learned something from the interview. Um, click the link at the comment section below to check out our Read Asian collection. Also in the comment section, help us improve our events. So kindly answer the events evaluation. Vida and Sir Dean, thank you again. Um, to everyone watching, discover Asian writing and art and support our campaign to read Asian. Keep on reading and happy weekend. Bye-bye.